Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the last study of this week. As we return to our conversation from yesterday, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and for the wisdom that we're going to need to be able to understand what others are presenting and compare this with the studies that we have had delving further into these prophetic periods. Shall we now ask for our Heavenly Father's guidance as we open his word? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunities that we have to study together. Direct us, please, in this study today. Help us to understand. Show us, Father, that which we should know. We need your strength, Father. We need your wisdom, and we need your guidance. Please be with us. Join with us in this meeting so that we may more properly reflect your character in all things that you would have us to do. May your angels attend us. May your spirit enlighten our minds. Help us so that we may be able to explain these items more clearly to those with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we finished roughly page 132 yesterday. And as we were talking about this, Pruitt had some points that we could see that there were some agreement and we could see some points so we have no agreement. This last paragraph on this page, emphatically the topic has been the unsealing of Daniel's prophecies at the time of the end. So when our Lord Jesus says, and from the taking away of the daily it will be 1,290 days. We ought to understand that this is a second way to arrive at the date of the time of the end. Now, his next paragraphs, as our pioneers noted, the word sanctuary is supplied in verse 11, as it is repeatedly in Daniel 8 and 11. So, when we are looking at Daniel 12, verse 11, I find it interesting because this must have been a typographical error on his part that was not caught by him or his editors because Daniel 12:11 doesn't say anything about the sanctuary and he from, must be the word sacrifice correct yeah, because I was trying to figure out what's he talking about here. But yeah, he means the supplied word of sacrifice. But in this in this type of situation, we can agree that sacrifice was a supplied word. Yeah. But neither he nor his editors, his proofreaders, caught the fact that he had substituted <laughs> sanctuary where it should say sacrifice. The Hebrew word translated daily is used 95 times outside the book of Daniel. 80 of these occurrences are translated continual or continually. Only two are translated daily. When used substantively, that is, as a noun, like it is in usage in the book of Daniel, the closest English equivalent is continuity. Interestingly, in Daniel 7, the fourth beast is said to be diverse from the first three. Daniel asks particularly about the diverse beast. He is told that it will be the fourth kingdom on the earth. And finally, in the next verse after that, we are told what makes the Roman beast diverse. Now, Pruitt's understanding of the daily is not being specifically addressed he doesn't want to touch on the daily except to recognize that it's there and he doesn't want to go into the subject of the daily so he doesn't go into it at all what are you seeing here well at this point he isn't i, I can't see the rest of what he says right um so he's just gonna he's just gonna gloss over that that's the way it looks because uh, i would think he would have he would hold to the pioneer view of the daily. So here, Pruitt goes back to Daniel 7, 7, 7, 19, 
723 and 724, because he wishes to delve more into what makes this fourth beast diverse. The question he asks after quoting these verses, do you see what makes the beast diverse? Look at the last verse just quoted. It is the little horn that differs from nations and kingdoms that preceded it. The diverse little horn, of course, dominates the rest of the prophecy and much of the book of Daniel. So what was it that brought an end to the continuity of empire successions in Daniel 7? It was the rise of the papacy as a small civil power. And this happened in 508, as described above, when proto-France became the first subjugated land of this little horn. Then that little horn shows up again in chapter 8, again, taking away the continuity. So, is he attempting a more literal interpretation than a figurative interpretation? I'm not sure. Uh, well, he, less clear. Stephen? Yeah, well, he's, he's sort of saying here that the, the daily is these here previous kingdoms. He doesn't really specifically say it's paganism. Right. Right. He's saying it's these here empires that have gone on before. And then he's saying that it's the, the papacy <clears throat> that uh, takes away the daily, which uh, is a bit, you know, I would say that it's uh, more that, well, we normally relate it to, uh, <clears throat> to the, the decision of maybe it's their influence of Clovis. Okay. Um, rather than them specifically, you know, maybe they have an influence in taking it away. Yeah. Uh, you must than, have some other power. Sorry. Go on. Sorry, what were you saying? Well, there should be another power that removes the daily so that the man of sin, uh, the son of perdition, perdition can be you know, take his place, right? Um, so if you read in uh, uh, Great Controversy Chapter 3, I mean, it's pretty clear that you have, you, one is you have paganism morphing into papalism, right? So that is happening. We have this this paganism and Christian garb being the papacy. Um, but it's pretty clear that the power that has to take it out of the way in Second Thessalonians is not the papacy itself. The papacy doesn't remove paganism so that it can be set up. It has to be taken out of the way. So I'm not really sure what he's getting at here, how the papacy removes the daily. Um, that doesn't make sense in the text either because it says that, you know, the, t- the daily shall be taken away and the abomination of desolation given, right, Natan, um, in its place. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, do you have more thoughts on that, Stephen? Yeah, I think it was more the secular powers seeing how mm-hmm. the, the papacy had or certainly seen how how uh, influential Christianity had can become an empire, and they eventually they adopt it. They sort of tried to morph with it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So you got the civil power and the religious power. So you have you have these pagan pagan nations, right? I mean, they're they're not that they're going to become Christian, and then so they have to remove the daily, and then they're going to set the papacy on the throne of the earth, right? So they're going to they're gonna give, in its place, the abomination that make it desolate. Because in Second Thessalonians, uh, it says, you know, um, in verse 6, and now ye know what withholdeth or restraineth, right, um, that he might be revealed, that is, the man of sin, in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now 
withholdeth, it said, let, said letteth in the King James, but it's the word, same word that's translated as withholdeth or restrains, well, restrain, until he be taken out of the way. So he has to be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So for the man of sin to be revealed, it, it's obviously not the papacy taking this thing that's hinders, hindering it out of the way. It's another power, right? So the civil powers. I'm just really puzzled by his... Uh, it, 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 is he just trying to skirt around the issue? It's kind it's of the way I, I'm, I'm kind of approaching it that he is attempting to skirt the issue because I don't think he wants to address it in the in the proper manner. So that he can kind of slip it under people's noses? Right. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I tend to be fairly direct even when I'm trying to be, uh, you know, wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Sometimes I can still be a little direct. I I just always feel it's better to be sort of straightforward and explain the issue and where I stand on an issue than to just kind of skirt around it. But um, but it doesn't make sense what he's saying. So when you get to this next paragraph, given what we were observing already, part of his premise becomes, to me, nonsensical. How is the little horn diverse? In Daniel 8, it differs from Persia and Greece in several ways. It had power over God's people, verse 10, even to the host of heaven. It magnified itself to equality with Prince Jesus, verse 11. The truth, verse 12, regarding the sanctuary, verse 11, was cast down. So, when we're looking at this from verse 11, as it reads, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So he must be referring to Daniel 7 and not Daniel 12, or is this strictly Daniel 8? Because if we go to Daniel 8, 11, we're talking about the little horn. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Here he's Daniel 8.11. Yeah, so, okay. So he says in Daniel 8, it differs from Persia and Greece in several ways. So he's talking about the vision of Daniel 8. And they have Persia, two horns, right, with the one higher than the other, and Greece with uh, the goat with the notable horn. Okay, it had power over God's people, even the host of heaven. Okay, so so he's not taking that as Christ's throne or anything. It was Christ, uh, you know, against Christ. It magnified itself to equality with the Prince of Jesus. Now, yeah. So then, um, now it magnified itself uh, against the Prince of the Host. We take this as pagan Rome, right? Correct. Um, I'm not sure if he is. I think he's not. I think he's taking this as, hmm, yeah. I'm not sure what his view is on that. Yeah, because he's saying the truth regarding the sanctuary was cast down, which we don't take that position. So he doesn't appear to have the pioneer view of the daily. He seems to have the new view of the daily. Right. But it's not very clear. That's huh. why I'm calling it nonsense. Yeah. In short. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. So I just Hello? got to email oh. you to you this pro proton mail. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Till I can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Kelly, um, 
you were saying once before that your um, the your church uh, the Calgary Central once did a study on the Davy and took the pioneer yeah. position. How yeah. long ago was that? Right around the same time, I was starting to figure it out. But afterwards, I was expecting the opposite. But uh, Terry, can't remember his name right now, but he understood the true, uh, the right about the daily, and and he was an elder, so he he asked. It was being studied, I think, in the Sabbath school lesson, and he yeah, wanted to correct that. Yeah, that was in 2012. That was in uh, the, the when we were studying the book of Thessalonians, or the books of Thessalonians, okay. First and Second Thessalonians. And okay. yeah, yeah. So I think it was at that time. So that's kind of weird. Yeah, he that, he the pastor allowed him to <clears throat> gather the whole church together. Well, whoever wanted to come. And uh, mm-hmm. especially the elders and Sabbath school teachers. And uh, yeah, he presented the correct understanding view of the daily quite clearly. People didn't have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. That uh, at the yesterday was mentioned future interpretations of was it the 12, 19, 13. 35, 35 yeah. and so on. Who's who's doing that? I do know someone surprisingly that is doing it. I thought even Doug Batchelor got onto it for a little while. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know of different people. I just, I just, it's very common that they don't accept the, uh, you know, especially the thirteen thirty-five. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, it just seems to be the you know, the prevailing view within Adventism that they've abandoned a lot of these pioneer understandings of prophecy. The, uh, you remember Margaret, Tom and Margaret Davis? Uh, yeah, I remember Righteousness Margaret. by Faith. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, she started teaching that, too. Futuristic, it's, I forget what, how they, what they use it. It's like the close of probation, the uh, time of trouble will be this long, and until, yeah, mm-hmm. and day for a day, day for a day. It's, it's just so amazing to see her accept that. It's weird. Yeah. So what did I miss? I'm late to class. Well, basically, we just started looking at, uh, again, these this interpretation that uh, um, Eugene Cruitt has, and and it just seems that he's, He's taking a view that's probably the new view of the daily, but it's not. He's he's not being very clear about it. Um, so he doesn't have the view that we have of Daniel chapter eight. Um, it doesn't appear that he does, and and of course that would affect, mm. you know, Daniel eleven verse thirty one and Daniel twelve verse eleven, where it talks about taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, in chapter 8, it's actually different because it is a different word than taken away. Um, instead of, uh, I think it's room there in chapter 8, it's sir in the other ones. So so here it's in chapter 8, it's to be lifted up and exalted when it says, it says taken out of the way mm. or taken away. Uh, but in the other ones, it's actually referring to it being replaced or removed. So Miller didn't really recognize that, that it was two different words. But he did connect it to Second Thessalonians. And if you read mm-hmm. Ellen White's commentary on Second Thessalonians chapter 2, um, she's showing the pioneer view of the daily. So she's describing what ends up happening um, in in our understanding of the pioneer view with the daily being paganism. She doesn't say the daily is paganism, but she's describing their view without addressing the daily directly uh, as a word. But here he's not addressing that. Um, he's talking about how, well, he does a typo. He says that 
the word sanctuary was the supplied word. He meant sacrifice, daily sacrifice, sacrifices supplied. But he doesn't really go into what that means and how that relates to the correct view of the daily that the pioneers were united upon. Those who gave the judgment hour message were all united upon the, uh, the true view of the daily. He doesn't address that. So he seems to have the new view. The from what I remember, uh, new view and old view are actually switched around because the old view was the wrong view, and the new view is the pioneer view, is it not? No, yeah, that's not quite true. Um, that's kind of a, a little bait and switch that people have done. There, actually, the view that oh, Miller yeah. has is not a view. So, so, so nobody ever had like a the, view. The heavenly sanctuary was uh, the daily. That that is um, oh. completely okay. new, right? Um, okay. There are some differences between P Miller's understanding of the daily because the idea that it's paganism uh, wasn't the prevailing view um, in in the way that he understood it. The two desolating powers. So that's kind of unique to Miller. But they, nobody hmm. had it as that. You know, Christ's heavenly sanctuary work was taken out of the way so that the papacy could be exalted. Nobody ever held that view until the new view came along. Oh, so, okay. Um, there were other views, but some people try to say that that's, that was the new view is the old view, but it's not. Uh, hmm. I think that's what uh, John Peters does. When he, hmm? Hmm? Tell us, uh, John Peters is it? Peters? Yeah, I know John Peters says that, but but he's wrong because I looked into it. Yeah, he doesn't give an explanation as who who taught that beforehand. He just sort of mentions that it was a an old view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's the, not uh, switch back and forth. They switch the miss the switch back and forth between the feminine and masculine and. Where in the daily between the two des how Miller figured out the desolating powers is that right? Switching okay, so in, in it, so in in Daniel chapter eight we have the little horn which represents both pagan and papal Rome. Whenever it's feminine, it's referring to papal Rome. Whenever it's masculine, it's referring to pagan Rome. And I don't think Miller right. looked at that at all. Because he didn't understand the masculine and the feminine, he wouldn't he wouldn't know that mm. using um, Pruden's concordance. Uh, so it's something how, that later on has noticed. Now, how, how did, did he figure it out? Uh, yeah. What he did is he he looked at the word "taketh away" um, and "taken out of the way" in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse seven. So he. Where, where it says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only now he who led us will let until he be taken out of the way. And that's when he, mm -hmm. when he makes the connection to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, then, then he understands what's taken out of the way. It's paganism. Now, okay. in the Sabbath school quarterly back in 2012, when we were studying Second Thessalonians, what they do is something quite unique because pretty much every Protestant commentator, when they go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, they recognize that the man of sin is the papacy, right, that exalts himself mm -hmm. above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sitteth in the temple of God showing itself that he is God, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then they say the power that has to be taken out of the way is pagan Rome. Right, so pagan Rome has to be hmm. taken out of the way of paganism in order for the papacy to be exalted. But what the what the quarterly does in 2012 is it argues that in Second Thessalonians it's Christ's heavenly ministry that has to be taken out of the way in order for the man of sin, the son of perdition, to be magnified or exalted, and and that is a completely unique view. Of Second Thessalonians chapter two, I've never seen a Protestant mm. commentator do that. Um, so that, mm. but they have to do it to be consistent with their new view of the daily. But, but that's a new interpretation, at least 
the first time I ever saw it was in 2012. Definitely wasn't a view that was held by uh, those who held the new view in the time of Ellen White uh, that were presenting the new view. They they wouldn't do that with Second Thessalonians, but but now the church, at least in that that quarterly, did. Hmm. So I hope that helps clear it up. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's just on. Yeah, I... go ahead. Go ahead. No. It's just amazing how our brother Jeff teaches the daily so clearly, but I don't know if that's even like so many things are being turned away from, like renouncing all the past light. The inconsistency is amazing. I even just try to just point that out to anybody that comes with something new. Well, where does it fall in line with the old truth? Is it in agreement? Does it bring more light to an old truth, an established truth, or... The arguments that uh, they use are so frustrating. It's, well, argument from silence. Ellen White never said anything. or She didn't have all the light. God didn't tell her everything. And they use that same logic with anything new that comes along. And it's uh, like the flat earth. And and uh, Lunar Sabbath uh, discussion yesterday with a friend, and I just asked him, well, does Ellen White mention it at all? Does the Bible mention it? And the reinterpretation of the Bible, there's only eight Sabbaths where in the Bible they say what day, and it's always the new moon Sabbath, and the curvature of the earth is, what is it, eight, eight inches squared, times i'm like well you're telling me these yeah things anyway you're, yeah you're so, i don't get it yeah the, the main yeah the main problem is that people if if ellen white doesn't come out so explicitly against something then oh you know she obviously just you know it wasn't light that was revealed to her and so we can go in a different direction um but but you know mm-hmm. one of the things we can look at is in in the new testament does it explicitly ever say, you know, the first day of the week is not the Sabbath, but the seventh day of the week is, and we need to, you know, it, in some ways it just doesn't address the issue in a direct enough way for people. So Ellen White, when it comes to the daily, we talked about this yesterday, but basically she was telling them that they needed to get together and study and not settle it with her writings. And, and I noticed mm-hmm. lots of times that Ellen White doesn't settle issues that hadn't been settled already by the church through study, right? It is, she's not going to step ahead mm. of, yeah. of the Holy Spirit, you know, teaching God's people through study uh, because she's not meant to replace the Bible, right? We, we need to study God's word. And so... Uh, when it comes to this issue here on dealing with the daily and the 12.9 and the 13.35, the light that we have now, understanding that there's a period of 13.35 uh, that, that goes from 1493 B.C. with the first league with the Gibeonites to the league with the Jews in 158, and uh, that that three years there is symbolized by the three days of the Gibeonites where they, they make this decision. Um, and then it's, you know, so 1335 is 666 times 2 plus 3, right? So you can actually go uh, 1332 days from the league with the Gibeonites to 161 when they first make the league and then 158 is when it goes into effect. And then you have 666 years to 508 and then 1335 to, you know, Sunset April 18th, 1844. And then we also have two 1290s, right? So from the founding of Rome, there's 1290 to 508, and then 1290 from 508 to 1798. So so we have some structures in there. And it also really helps us. Um, so this, you know, we can say that's new light, but that new light 
magnifies the old light, doesn't do away with right. it. Right. Right. And that's the difference between the new light that people want to have that weakens the old, or when when we've had new light in this movement regarding the prophetic periods and and, and the chronology, well, that's just making everything clearer. It's it's establishing what's already there. And to get people to see that, that's the frustrating thing, is that people are so leery of anything they've never heard of before that mm-hmm. th- they just think it's all error, right? So that, that's, that's really the frustrating part for me, is that people won't look at things. Yeah. I mean, I remember yeah, once uh, I... sharing something as a Sabbath school teacher in, in, in Warburg, I think it was the 666 years of, uh, you know, from the captivity of Jehoiachin to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And, you know, I think it was Lori, you know, said, oh, where's this going? Where, mm-hmm. where are you going with it? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I don't, I've never heard this before. There must be something that, you know, is uh, mm-hmm. it's going in some direction that maybe mm-hmm. we don't want to hear. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, and, and it's such a profound thing because one is it's also connected to the, the, un, the correct under, understanding of the daily because there's the 666 years that we get from the book of Ezekiel. And then there's two periods of 666 years, one that goes from 158 to 508 and another one that goes from uh, the time they have Jewish independence. So it's 129 and 128 BC to 538. So we got three periods of 666 years. You know, we have two periods of 1290. We have two periods of 1335 mm-hmm. connected with that Miller's 666 mm-hmm. years. So, so they all become this wonderful structure, but people aren't willing to look at it because they never heard it before. So, are, are they compare it to what they have heard before in terms of like the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism of numbers and mm-hmm. uh, et cetera, numerology? Yeah. They dismiss it. Yeah, or it's, yeah, or it's yeah. just numbers are scary. Uh, people don't like numbers. Well, <laughs> they require effort. Yeah. What is it about New Light uh, that the uh, Spirit of Prophecy mentions that when it comes that people would be afraid of it? Or well, yeah, so you're talking about that like quote that? where she says that because um, you used to use that one all the time where it talks about they will see in it something dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I can't remember the whole quote. But anyway, what yeah. we see here is as Dwight's going through this um, here with Eugene Pruitt, is that there is lots of confusion. That is, the new light is a rejection of old light. That that you know that's I mean to Adventism in regard to Daniel chapter twelve and the daily and so forth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, is there the time is it are we good to study some more there are you guys going on that i said uh, don't want to but well we got study. A, we got another hour of study here okay yeah okay dwight yep so as pruitt continued here in short the little horn was intent on something more than secular dominion it was domineering over the people of God and over the truth. And this is precisely how Daniel 7 characterizes the little horn in the next verse after verse 24 above. In verse 25, the people of God are given into the papacy's power for 1,260 days, and the truth regarding the law is perverted by her. So we are not surprised. Okay. To- Go ahead. Yeah, so what is he saying? Can we go back, please? It didn't yes, make sir. any sense. <laughs> okay. So, Pruitt... So now he's going to jump to Daniel 7. Right. right. And then is he talking about Daniel 8 now or Daniel 12? Well, it seems like what he's doing is skipping. He starts out talking about Daniel 12 to begin with, then jumps into Daniel 7, then to Daniel 8, then back to 7, and then segues again into Daniel 8. 
Okay. So, so what he's missing here is that there is a difference between um, the little horn in Daniel 7 and the little horn in Daniel 8. Right. Because the little horn in Daniel 7 is the papacy. Right. right? It's not pagan and papal Rome. In Daniel 8, the little horn is both pagan and papal Rome. Agreed. And that's well understood even by, you know, regular Adventist uh, theologians, that there's this dual nature of the, the, the little horn. And that's because in Daniel chapter 8, we don't see a separate beast that is Rome, right? We see a little horn that represents Rome all by itself, both pagan and papal. In Daniel 7, that little horn comes off this diverse beast, right? So, it, it, and this kind of mistake, I mean, it's similar to what happens when people look at the beasts in Revelation uh, 12, uh, 13, and 17. You know, they see things that are the same and they just think they're the same, but symbols are being used differently. So obviously there isn't a separate beast. There is in, in Daniel 8, there's the goat, there's the, the, or the ram first, then the goat, and then the little horn, which is pagan and papal Rome. In Daniel 7, you go, of course, have, you know, you know Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and then Rome is this diverse beast. Um, so you would have to compare the diverse beast with the little horn of Daniel 8, not the horn of the little horn in Daniel 7 with the little horn in Daniel 8, right? Right. I hope it's clear. Okay, we we'll go on. So I don't sure what he's trying to do. So we'll try, we'll attempt this again. In short, the little horn was intent on something more than secular dominion. It was domineering over the people of God and over the truth. And this is precisely how Daniel 7 characterizes the little horn in the next verse, after verse 24 above. In verse 25, the people of God are given into the papacy's power for 1,260 days, and the truth regarding the law is perverted by her. It's interesting because as we have studied in the past, we wind up with a power that can be male and then female and then back to male. Well, in, in chapter 8. Yes. Yeah. In chapter 7, the little horn there is the papacy. It is, you know, not pagan and papal Rome, so... Now, so uh, the idea there is that, you know, the, the feminine and masculine, which is a Hebrew uh, characteristic. Um, now, some people say that, you know, it relates to like transgenderism or something like that. I, I'm not sure if I quite would go that that's what it's trying to illustrate. Uh, I think it's just simply that in order to take that little horn to represent pagan and papal Rome, they're going to use the masculine to represent pagan Rome and the feminine. So the actions of pagan Rome and the feminine to use the actions of papal Rome. And, and that's, that's well understood by Adventist commentators. You know, the Daniel Revelation Committee, that, that when they looked at that, that, that's how they did it. But I've seen other people now trying to do different things with it. Uh, so, but it, to me, it's just, it's just the, the way that it's, it's characterized in, in Daniel chapter 8. That's how Rome is characterized. So the one that exalts itself against the prince, um, uh, how is it? the prince of the host, that's going to be pagan Rome, not papal Rome. The one that uh, uh, exalts lifts up and exalts the daily, that's going to be papal Rome. So, right. So I'm just going to quickly go through this here. So you've got this little horn. Um, and that's out of one of them, that's out of one of the four winds, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. That's the action of pagan Rome, right? That's the territory that it conquers. Right. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, which uh, 
some people say, well, that's the vertical, you know, it's going up, it's going up into Christ's sanctuary in heaven, but really the, the host of heaven uh, and casting down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. Um, this is obviously referring to its persecution, and this is is the papal persecution. So the it wax it right. That's the feminine uh, wax great. So that's going to be the action of the uh, the papacy. So it's going to show these two different phases, and and it's also going to stamp right. It's going to cast of the host of the stars to the ground and stamp upon them. So remember the action of papal Rome is the stamping, the treading underfoot. Right, it's not the scattering power. That's going to be the pagan powers that do the scattering of the power of the holy people. It's the papacy that stamps or treads underfoot, you know, treads underfoot the holy city, uh, etc. And then it says, and he magnified himself against the prince of the host. So that's pagan Rome, <clears throat> right? And and then it says, and from him, it says by in the King James, but it's from him. <clears throat> the daily was taken away. So the, so from pagan Rome, the daily is taken away. That is, it's lifted up, up and exalted. And that's going to be by the papacy and the place of his sanctuary. That's Rome itself with the pantheon was cast down. And then it says, and host was given. Now it has him there in the King James in verse 12. But the hymn is actually a supplied word. It's actually in the feminine. So the host was given uh, against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Again, that's the papacy, not the not pagan will. And then you're going to have the question in 8:13. I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said, "Unto that certain saint, Palmoni." which spake, how long shall be the vision, that is the chazon, concerning the daily, that's the 1260 years of the scattering of the power of the holy people, and the transgression of desolation, that's the papacy, the 1260 years of papal dominion, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And... Uh, so the sanctuary there is Kodesh, so that can refer to a God sanctuary, whether earthly or heavenly. Uh, the other sanctuary earlier on in verse 11 is Mikdash, which is never used in reference to the heavenly sanctuary. So it can't be Christ's heavenly sanctuary that was cast down, as the new view of the daily has. Um, so hopefully people can follow what I, my explanation. But the idea then is you have these two powers. Now here, they're not <clears throat> taking right. away, I, I not going to talk about taking away the daily and setting up the transgression. It's just going to talk about how long is that whole period, right? And then what they're going to the get one on is, 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 yeah. The one on Kodesh again. Kodesh and Mikdash. Yeah, Mikdash Kodesh, is, I, I know, is Yeah. I actually have a friend named Kodesh, so that's interesting, oh, yeah. yeah. His last yeah. name or first name? His first name. He, no. he's, uh, I, I worked with him. David Kadosh. So that's... Uh, he, he's Israeli. Kodesh. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So anyway, um, so the question about the how long, the way that it's answered is what's addressed is actually the 2300 days. In, can answer it. And, and the question is, why is that the answer to the question about how long is the 2520, right? Um, and the reason why that's the answer is because what's, what's going to be addressed in, as we go through Daniel is that, that there is these two 2520s. So we can see that the one that the question is about these two periods that actually end in 1798, but the answer is that there is this sanctuary that needs to be cleansed, which is the heavenly sanctuary, and that's going to be ending in 1844. And so Daniel's not given enough information in chapter 8 to figure that out. That's why he doesn't understand it. 
But when he's given in chapter 9 the starting point for the 70 weeks, it's also the starting point for the 2300 days. And so now, final thing in chapter 10, 11, and 12 is to explain to him, to give him enough information so he can understand the 2520 prophetic mirror, how that all fits together. So, you know, and right now I'm working on this paper, so that's why I'm, I've been thinking about all these things and how they fit together. Okay, so Dwight? Yep. So as Pruitt had gone through this part of it, he continues, so we are not surprised to find Daniel 12 referring back to the little horn's rise in two stages. In the first stage, a triple crown power makes its first national conquest. The diverse little horn rises. In the second stage, the little horn subdues three others with the empire's forces, making them her own and rises to world dominion. From either of these dates, men may know the timing of the time of the end. It is 1,290 years from the first and 1,260 years from the second. Both bring you to 1798, when, in a perfectly sensible conclusion to either reckoning, the papacy simultaneously loses both world dominion and national existence. Rome was made a republic by the French. Now, is he here giving a very tacit comment on the king of the north, king of the south? Or is he attempting yet to apply the 1290 and 1260 in a different manner than the pioneers had done? Because he's certainly not applying daily to the 1290 and the abomination which maketh desolate to the 1260. Jerry, can I ask y'all a question about the king of the south? Sure. What? what? Well, I, I was asked, um, I was told the other day that the king of the south was the king, the king that protects God's people. Is that true? My understanding about the king of the south is it's atheism? Is that? Right, that's the way I always believe it. But, um, that's what I was told a couple of days ago. Is atheism? Oh, uh, that it's, or... uh, it's, well, it's the people that protect God's Peace. I thought that was by, Islam. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. I I would be by, in more agreement that it is Islam that gives protection to God's people. Mm. I don't see atheism protecting God's people. Right. Well, somehow yeah, another is, church. Um, Oh, so, yeah, so the reason why he said it's the king of the remember, South. Remember, Islam was like a distraction. Is, Anytime the forces of... Or is Islam in What's that? Any, any, anytime uh, like the scriptures were... The men of the East preserved <laughs> the scriptures. And the other one was so that... Was it the, during the Crusades when the Christians were cornered? Islam's armies would show up and distract Rome's armies, and that's how they protected God's people. Is that the history as I remember it? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's that what, part. Is of that it. what you were thinking, William? Like along that line? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's what I've always thought that the Islam was the right. ones that came in to protect God's people, but the church is teaching teaching these um, people in the church. They're teaching them that the king of the south is the ones that protect God's people. So that's because now, they believe yeah. the king of the south is Islam. Well, it might be. I don't know. But it, that's, what no, they, that's, that's why. That's why. They're teaching that the mm. king of the south is Islam. They're not teaching the king of the south is atheism. That's, that's why. I'm sorry to distract y'all. I just wanted to ask the question. No, no. Well, well, that's what we were addressing there with um, Tim Ro Rosenberg that uh, Ron says was presenting at uh, on Sabbath at his church. So he was presenting the idea that Islam is the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, right? So if you believe Islam is the king of the south, then, and you, we know that Islam is protecting God's people, then you're going to say the king of the south is protecting God's people. 
But we know that the king of the south represents this atheistic power, and, and they're fighting against the king of the north. Right? And the king of the north is, is the papacy. Of course, the United States becomes connected with the papacy um, in you know, 1989. But, uh, but back in uh, 1798, it's going to be France that represents that atheistic power that comes against the papacy. And then in 1989, the United States with the papacy is going to come against the King of the South, which that time is the Soviet Union. So, I mean, that's really the, the, the main principle, foundational Daniel text of this movement is the understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Um, so, but yeah, that's the problem um, that people are fighting against this uh, this movement even though they may not be doing it directly that is they're not um openly saying here is why we have this new view of daniel 11 verse 40 to 45 but it is meant to create confusion so i mean it, it's so very clear i mean that was the nice thing about uh swearingen's book is he does have a very similar view to ours in that he takes that the king of the north is the papacy and and the king of the south is france and in in daniel 11 verse 40a and then he has the same view that we have as daniel 11 40b is the king of the north is the papacy with the united states and the king of the south is the soviet union and that's 1989 so he he has that same view he just doesn't he doesn't label it as the time of the end but really, what what is um, I don't really understand what uh, where's the white Stephen? Do you have any thoughts on this? The white disappeared. I was looking at it this morning, and the daily or being the continual. I was just sort of adding that then to four or five of it to then connecting it with baptism of Clovis. Have there like a like a death and resurrection with the baptism, and then I was comparing that to to Jesus Christ, who is uh, from everlasting in Micah five verse two. So that would be paralleling the the continual, and then he has a, like a, a transformation into a be in Bethlehem. And then 30 years, we parallel the 30 years there of Christ's preparation period before his baptism to the 30 years from 508 to 538. So just a, a maybe an additional thought. I think uh, I don't know. I don't know if um, Jeff mentioned that. It's just something maybe an additional sort of nuance to that. Uh, pattern of Christ study that he done. Yeah, yeah, there's, and, you and know, there's, there's an the three, three years, years of his what? the three um, years of his his ministry fit in there after the thirty years of preparation. Right? And and it was thirty years for him to become a priest because the high priest because that's how old they had to be. And we find that that is when the brain is ready or fully developed to be a priest. Yeah, reaches so Kelly, a milestone, so, the brain, the human brain. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so I'll address this here. So first, mm -hmm. we know in the story of Joseph, we have the 30 years, right? And that there is a parallel in the story of Joseph to the 30 years of Christ. There's lots of parallels between Joseph and Christ. Now, now Joseph is typifying Christ. The papacy is a counterfeit of that. But we also can connect. In, in the story of Joseph, remember, there's going to be uh, the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine is divided into two and five, right? So there's going to be two years of the famine. That's when they're going to, uh, that's when Jacob's going to enter into Egypt, and then there's five years left. And we can take that two and that five and we can take the seven. So the seven years of plenty in Christ, he has the 30 years, and then he has the seven years of his 
confirming the covenant with many for one week. And that parallels with Joseph, who has 30 years old when he interprets Pharaoh's dream, then he has seven years of plenty. So the seven years of plenty parallels the week of Christ. And then he's going to have the two and the five. But in, in Christ, that's going to be um, the 504 years for pagan Rome from 34 AD to 538. And that's two times 252. And then you're going to have five times 252, which is 1260. So in, in the story of Christ, that's expanded. But it is connected to the, the counterfeit, right? So the, the counterfeit covenant week is, is Satan's. The 30 years is going to be in the center there, right? So instead of at the very beginning. Um, but we also now know we have that, you know, that um, 1290 going back uh, from 538 or the 1260 going back from 508 to the founding of Rome in 753. So, <clears throat> so pagan Rome is connected to papal Rome. It, it, and, and these 30 years are all, they're all connected as well, except one is a counterfeit. Um, so there's more to it than that, but uh, does that kind of help a little bit? Okay, Mike? Yep. Back, back to you there. Sorry for the interruption on my side. So Smith seemed to have one way of looking at things. Pruitt tacitly is more convinced of the new view of the daily, but he is attempting then to skirt the issue, thinking that by going to this other view of the daily, that he is adhering to the point that Mrs. White was being shown, but is not willing, I mean, here Pruitt is not really willing to study these things out. So he and, can- and the, one thing that we, and the one thing that we have to do, so Stephen brought up, you know, the study that he's doing with 508, <clears throat> we really need to sit down. I mean, Stephen's obviously putting together these statements and, and examine examine the different arguments for how we establish 508. But with, with the idea that Clovis, you know, being baptized on Christmas Day in 508, I think is something that really helps us understand what's connected with the taking away of the daily. Um, and then the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. What happens in 538? You know, there's the Sunday loss that occurs in 538. I always forget the name of the, the whole thing, but uh, can you remind us the name of, of what happens in 508, Stephen? 538, I mean. Can you explain well, that kind, again? What you the, the Council of Orleans, the third, I think it's the third Council of Orleans. Yeah. Okay. They, uh, of the Sunday law. You know, you know it's kind uh, of interesting as we had been addressing this yesterday because last evening I was made aware of a paper from 2017 from the International Journal of Humanities and Social Science. The title of this paper was 538 AD and the Transition from Pagan Roman Empire to Holy Roman Empire. Justinian's metamorphosis from chief of staffs to theologian. And one of the co-authors of this paper was E. Gerard Damsteed. Mm -hmm. Stephen, are you aware of this paper? No, I'm not. Okay. You know, I, one possibility dealing with all of this 508 and 538, I mean, we have different views. So different people have taken different different views in trying to support those dates that Miller has. Right? Right. Heidi Heitz is one way of doing it, you know, rejecting the old view of the daily. So he says, you know, we're going to keep those dates, but we're going to get rid of the, the daily being paganism. Other people just have, you know, it has to do with the different nations that are conquered. Um, but some of those things don't seem to work. Miller has a view, which I can't remember what it is. Um, Stephen knows 
but it's going to be different than what was proposed by people like Josiah Litch, right? So there's going to be these different views that were held at different times. And, and you, we see here now Pruitt has a different view again, right? So his is different. Um, but we need to sort this out. It, it, it needs to be something that we can say, this is correct. So is is Pruitt is Pruitt the one that Jeff had a public meeting with? They were each going to speak, and Jeff walked off because he was being dishonest. Yes. Is that well, because he says that, that was like me. That was Pruitt, yeah. so that's interesting. Yeah. That was Pruitt's the one that said, "Well, Alan White makes mistakes, and Jeff just couldn't handle that." That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So. As Pruitt was finishing this portion, dating from the first of these events, Jesus continues, we will find a blessed movement rising after 1798. What do we know about the movement from Daniel 12.12? Here he quotes Daniel 12.12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. We know that the movement is blessed. We know that the movement is a waiting movement. We know that the movement has a time in mind. They are coming to a date. We know that the date is 1843, 1335 days plus a 508 start date. The rest of Daniel 12, we know that the movement is based on an understanding of the book of Daniel opened in 1798. So the book of Daniel concludes with a prophecy of the blessed Advent movement the only movement rising in response to an understanding of the book of Daniel to wait for an event in 1843. Now, his next thought is he asks, what event? The Bible does answer this question. Habakkuk described this same period of time. We find the Lord referring to some prophecy that could be written on tables and that men should run when they read it. Daniel had mentioned that men would run to and fro when the book was unsealed. Habakkuk indicated that the vision had a time prophecy regarding when it would speak, or as Daniel said, be unsealed. Now, keeping chronology in mind, which came first, Daniel or Habakkuk? Well, uh, Habakkuk. So Daniel... Oh, wait, no. So which came first? Which, okay, um, yeah, Habakkuk's going to be writing in, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It's hard to know exactly when Habakkuk was written, but I think he's going to be before Daniel. Well, he's definitely written before Daniel was written. I'm trying to think if he's contemporary of Daniel's or not. I think it's in the time of Josiah. He, yeah, I think he's in the time of Josiah. So that there's implication that that's where he is in around, um, yeah, prior to the fall of the Assyrian Empire. So he's before Daniel. So when we're keeping this in mind, Habakkuk would be written before Daniel. So Daniel would be supportive of Habakkuk. Daniel and Ezekiel were contemporaries. So they would have an understanding of what Habakkuk had had to, had to provide just as much as Daniel had testified that he was coming to an understanding of what Jeremiah had provided. And we know that Habakkuk, when he says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that's the chazon. Right. Right. So the 1843 chart has the chazon, at least starting in 677 to 1843, right? So the 1843 chart is a 2520 chart, as is the 1850 chart, though so it goes to 1844. Right. So in this situation, Habakkuk sets the table. Daniel returns to understand what has already been presented so that when Habakkuk is telling us that the truth would be written on tables, he is referring to the panoramic vision, the wide vision. Daniel supports this, 
But then Daniel begins to narrow the vision down when he begins to understand the mare. Now here, Pruitt quotes Habakkuk 2, 2 to 4. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul is lifted up, is not upright in him, and the just shall live by his faith. The prophet was shown that whatever event the blessed persons were waiting for, it would not happen when they expected that it would. It would appear to tarry. And what were they to be doing? They were to wait for it because it would surely come. Also, the time prophecy would be fulfilled punctually despite appearances. Pruitt continues. But what were the Daniel 12, 12 people waiting for? Paul, quoting Habakkuk, gives our final answer. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Is Paul in Hebrews talking about 1843 to 44? Or is he giving a, a clear reference about the second coming? Well, um, well, he's talking about the second coming. But one of the things we see about the 1335 is it's the ushering in of the kingdom. Um, how is that? Uh, I'm trying to. So, um, yeah, I've been looking at these. I've been studying this in detail, putting together this paper. So uh, I guess the way to look at this is. So when Ellen White talks about these in 351 of Great Controversy, okay. right, we talked about before, um, we have three periods that are being mentioned, right? So she's going to say the experience of the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ had its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaimed the message of his second advent. As the disciples went out preaching, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. So Miller and his associates proclaimed the longest and last prophetic period brought to the view in the Bible was about to expire. That's the 2520. That the judgment was at hand. That's the 2300 days. And the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. That's the 1335. Right? So that's the way that she's looking at these three periods. She's she's not giving what they are as far as the length of time, but that's what she's referring to. So we can see that the 1335 is about the everlasting kingdom to be ushered in. So that's the second coming of Christ. Yet, we look at the 1335 as ending on, you know, the beginning of the Jewish or the last day of the Jewish year, 1843, in the beginning of the Jewish year, 1844, right? And then we're going to have, you know, 187 days to the end of the Day of Atonement um, in Millerite history. But we know that that is typical of what's going to happen at the end. So when Paul applies this um, to the second coming, because that's what I believe that he's doing, that 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 that's consistent with the understanding of the 1335 having to do with the ushering in of God's kingdom and and so we are in the time of the second coming in a sense since since 1844 so miller's miller brings us up to initially he believes that's going to bring us up to the second coming the, his his prophecies right He's gonna right. he's gonna have both twenty five twenty to twenty 
not both, but all three, the 2520, the 2300 days, and the 1335. He's going to have them all ending in the spring of 1844. Now, Samuel Snow comes along, and he recognizes that it's going to be in the fall um, on the 10th day of the seventh month. And, and so we have that in Habakkuk 2, the blessing that comes is those that come through that experience of the first disappointment will experience the message of the second angel, right? So they're going to experience the, the proclamation of the seventh month movement, and uh, they're going to um, uh, have the second disappointment, the blessing of the second disappointment, the great disappointment. They may not look at it as a blessing, but it is. <laughs> but those tie into our time, right? Because in our time, and we saw that already in Daniel, that it doesn't just deal with 1798 as the time of the end. It also deals with 1989 as the time of the end. And uh, so, so we can see that that history of the Millerite history is being repeated in our history. So if we're going to parallel that 1335, it goes to the first day of the first month, the arrival of the second angel, correct? Right. Exactly. And in our, in our history, that's 9-11. No disagreement. Now, I wonder if we can connect that in some ways to, uh, I mean, the way that we've connected it is, so when we get to that first day of the first month, we know that there's 187 days, right? 186 days if you count cardinal, 187 inclusive days to the 10th day of the seventh month. Now then we notice that 2300 lunar months is 186 solar years, or actually biblical years to be precise. So if we go from the first day of the first month in Millerite history, right, so April 19th, and we count 186 years or 2300 lunar months, we come to the first day of the first month in 2030. We've noticed this. And we can connect that first day of the first month in 2030 in the story of Ezra with the 354 days. We use a day for a month. And that ties two different ways we can tie 9-11 to that history. So we, we still haven't put it all together completely because we have this future date, April 5th, 2030. And we're not predicting anything on it. We say it's just a symbolic date. But we can see that it gives witness to our time that there is this blessedness uh, that we receive. And so maybe there's some way that we could connect 9-11 also to, uh, you know, through some other way, not because we already have it connected with, with uh, 354 days. They go from the first day of the first month when he leaves Babylon to the first day of the first month when their divorce from the strange wives happens, that one-year period. So I think it's something we have to sort of think about a little bit. You know, how does the 1335 in Millerite history, how does that relate? So obviously we see 9-11 there, right? Uh, so maybe, maybe I've already explained it. Maybe that's, that's all there is. That it's going to be that... Uh, you know, because the question with the 2300 days, we know it ends October 22nd, 1844, but Miller originally had it ending, you know, in the spring of 1844. So, so there's something there that I have to think about a bit more. But, but Pruitt is right here in, in, you know, obviously connecting this to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 35 to 38. Uh, because, but because Paul is quoting Habakkuk. Uh, chapter two, but he's applying it to the second coming. Okay. So, as Pruitt continued here, taking together Daniel 12, Habakkuk 2, and Hebrews 10, teach that a blessed group of persons would study the recently unsealed book of Daniel, and as a result, they would make charts to warn the world to prepare for Christ's coming. He that shall come will come. They would be looking for that coming, says Daniel 12, in 1843. Why not 1844? The answer is plain. 
1335 days is not about the event at its termination. No terminating event is given in the text. The 1335 is about the blessedness of a movement that was waiting for Christ's coming based on an understanding of Daniel. And what year were the Adventists looking forward to during the years leading up to 1843? Not 1844, but 1843. So, so he's going to make the same uh, arguments that Smith made, that the blessedness is about the year 1843. Right. Right. So, which, which I think is a mistake, because I think the blessedness is not the year 1843, but what happens once you wait and come to the arrival of the second angel in 1844. Right. Because this is talking about the tarrying, and the tarrying time is not the time prior to April 19th. It's going to be the time after April 19th, right? Right. It begins on April 19th. So when, so, you know, he shall come and he will come and he will not tarry. Well, obviously, this, this, and the way that Ellen White says, she says, when the first disappointment happened, uh, I have it here in my paper. I know our time has just expired, but I'll read this. I should have it here. So she says, uh, when the time passed at which the Lord's coming was first expected in the spring of 1844, those who had looked in faith for his appearing were for a season involved in doubt and uncertainty, while the world regarded them as having been utterly defeated and proved to be have been cherishing a delusion their source of consolation was still the word of God. Many continued to search the scriptures, examining anew the evidences of their faith and carefully studying the prophecies to obtain further light. Uh, the Bible testimony in support of their position seemed clear and conclusive. Signs, which could not be mistaken, pointing, pointed to the coming of Christ as near. The special blessing of the Lord, both in the conversion of sinners and the revival of the spiritual life among Christians, I testified that the message was of heaven. And though the believers could not explain their disappointment, they felt assured that God had led them in their past experience. Interwoven with the prophecies, which they had regarded as applying to the time of the second advent, was instruction specially adapted to their state of uncertainty and suspense, and encouraging them to wait patiently in the faith that, was, that, that what was now dark to their understanding would in due time be made plain. So she places habit, and then she quotes Habakkuk 2, verse 1 to 4. So she places this after the disappointment, right? Right. So she says, when the time is past, and she says, then they study, then this is when they have their blessedness, right? It's, it's in this period. So, so the tearing time is what it brings us to. So blessed is he that that experience the tearing time because the 1335 comes to the tearing time. So if you pass that test, then you receive the blessing, not before. So both Smith and Proof get it wrong. Now, what's interesting with this, in the way that he has chosen not to examine this, when you bring this to the understanding that April 19th of 1844 would be the close of the biblical year of 1843. Can we then apply the symbol of the time of tarrying from April 19th, 1844 to October 22nd, 1844? As, be, as being numerically represented by the 187. And you're being asked for a reference for what you just read from, from the Spirit of Prophecy, and I thought that was from uh, Great Controversy, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, from the Great Controversy. It's uh, going to be, uh, I'm just get the page. Oh, I should have remembered this. It's 391. Okay. Okay. Anyway, there is a bit more to cover with this. 
but we are now at the close of our time for the day. Any other thoughts or questions at the moment? Uh, just briefly, that word cometh, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh. Yes. Uh, is the word that has been understood to uh, relate to reaching or to to touching. So in a sense, it's like touching that uh, that end, the new Hebrew year, in a sense. Right. Excellent point. Because this, when it cometh, when it touches, it's not that we're seeing it be part of the 1843. We're seeing it that it touches in what is to come. That's the way I would take it anyway. Okay. Ain't, ain't, it, a, ain't it a point in time? So am I wrong on that? Well, it doesn't matter. It's a point. It's, it's bringing us to the end of the 1335 and the, the oh, revival yeah. of the second angel. So the blessing comes in the tearing time. So it's it's bringing you to the tearing time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these studies and these conversations that we've had this week, the opening of your word, so that we may more clearly understand that which we need to understand and that which will confront us in the near future. Help us now, Father. Guide us so that what what we are doing may in all ways Bring glory to your name. May your character be glorified. May we be tried, made white, and purified as we come to understand more that you would have us to understand. Direct our steps this day. Be with us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen.